I do some consulting work on the American feeling Indian in the room was You probably, don't ever say to her that her point about the shower coins. We lost a discussion on the ethical we we of more of a community trying to back up doing in autism. 15,000 children were imprisoned at Terezin, a Nazi concentration camp in Czechoslovakia. Inga Auerbacher was part of the meager 1% who survived. For years, she suffered from tuberculosis as a result of the terrible conditions during her captivity. She emigrated to the U.S. in 1946 and became a successful chemist and an accomplished writer. She's the author of six books, including I Am a Star, Child of the Holocaust, and has been honored with numerous awards. As the community of survivors dwindles, Auerbacher speaks throughout the world on the Holocaust, tolerance, and human rights. Here's our conversation with Inga Auerbacher. Inga Auerbacher, thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to be with you today. Like all stories, yours has a beginning, middle, and an end. And I'd like to start by talking about your life before the Holocaust. Sure. Uh, I was born in a little village in southwestern Germany called Kippenheim, very near the French-Swiss border, a village of about 2,000 people, 60 uh, Jewish families, and I'm the last uh, Jewish child to be born there. And we were a wonderful community. Um, yes, the Jewish community was a little bit isolated. We took care of ourselves, but it didn't mean that we had uh, not good relations with the Christian neighbors. And um, there was no real hospital there. It was almost closed at that time, so I was born in my own house, in my parents' bedroom. And uh, there was only one doctor, and he wasn't Jewish, and he already belonged to the Nazi party, to the SS, actually. But he still took very good care of his Jewish patients. Later on, he did some terrible things, probably the euthanasia program, killing people with mental and physical difficulty, and he was jailed for many, many years. But to me, he gave me life. I cannot say any bad things about him. It wasn't until about 1938 that yes. you started to feel, really feel, uh, anti-Semitism. That's D Describe true. what that was like in the eyes of a child. Because well, by then you were four or five years old. Yeah, not even, not even. Um, I spent a great deal of time also with my grandparents, from my, the parents of my mother, um, in an even smaller village. So I was partially in Kippenheim and partially in that village. Um, and the first real feeling I had of Jewish hatred was in November 9th and 10th, Crystal Night, the first major riot against the Jewish people in modern times. And the riot took place in Germany and in Austria. I was not even three years old. Grandparents came to see us many times. We went there, they came to us. And Grandpa was very religious. We, I came from an Orthodox family, modern Orthodox. Grandpa went to the synagogue in the morning to say his morning prayers. It was November 10th in Kippenheim. It was a two-day riot. And he was taken from his prayers, wearing his prayer shawl, ripped from all of that, and sent to the Dachau concentration camp. Then the police came to our house and arrested my father and sent him also to Dachau. All boys and men from the age of 16 on were sent to concentration camps uh, on November 9th and 10th. By us, it was Dachau. Other, uh, and in fact, your places, grandfather. It was Buchenwald. Your grandfather and father were actually released from Dachau, which is yeah, amazing. But, yeah, but what, I, what is even more strange, my father fought in World War I, and he was wounded badly in his and shoulder. Was a decorated soldier. Yes, he had the Iron Cross. And when he reached uh, Dachau, they said, you can throw everything away. It doesn't mean anything. You can throw your uh, cross away. 
they were treated very badly, I had to give up their clothing, wear the blue and white striped pajamas, no underwear, uh, stand at attention for hours in the bitter cold, and if somebody even wanted to blow the nose, they were hosed down with ice cold water. And at home, back at home, the riot was absolutely terrible. All the Jewish houses and businesses were um, attacked. All the windows were broken. I was standing with my grandmother and mother in the living room, glass all over the place. And one of the hoodlums looked through the broken window and he said, oh, the chandelier's still hanging. And he threw a big rock through the window. My mother just pulled me away and then we were hiding in the backyard shed until the riot was over. Your father believed all of this would, would blow over. Yes. Uh, while some of your family members actually emigrated to Brazil, your father yes. had such faith and such love Absolutely. for Germany Absolutely. Uh, that he thought this would blow over and you would be okay. That all changed uh, it, in, in 1939. Absolutely. In 1938, his, his shop, his business was taken from everything. him. Everything. We lost our citizenship. I might have been a citizen maybe nine months of my life when we became stateless. And um, well, um, somehow they were allowed uh, to come home again, my father and my grandfather. My mother bought some bogus tickets to some South American country. It was really nothing. And she somehow got my father out and my grandfather out of the camp. The yes, out of Dachau. And then, of course, uh, it was quite clear we have to leave. We just were too late to try to get out. Uh, By then, other countries were not accepting Oh, nothing, Jews. nothing. And we probably had a number uh, to come to America. My mother's brother already had uh, gotten into America, to New York. And uh, it, it might have taken 10 years, the number we had. Brazil was closing up everything. But we still tried. We sold our house at a, re a very cheap price and moved in with my grandparents, hoping with all our hearts to get out. My grandfather didn't want to go. He said, I'm born here, I want to die here. And he and, did. And he did, yes, he did. You have with you the actual yes. yellow star yes. that w you were forced to sew on your jacket in 1941. You were a young, you're yes. six years old? I'm six years old. Anybody from the age of six on had to wear the yellow star, which came on a yellow sheet like a cloth, very poor cloth. You had to pay for them. You, we had to pay for the damaged crystal night, and we had to pay for the trip to the camp. And uh, you still see the thread on it that I ripped off the star on May 8, 1945, when I was deported, and everybody had to wear this star. Your father told you, because you were talking about this long bus ride you were taking to the Jewish school that you were forced to go to at train. six. Train. Train ride, Here yeah. you are by yourself at six. Right. And your father told you. Sit on, on the left side that you can naturally cover up your star. star. But there was one hero in my mind, uh, a German woman, a Christian woman, who came up and saw uh, this little girl. She, she didn't want to be just a bystander. So this is the whole thing about bystanders. Elie Wiesel says they are equally guilty. But this woman had a soul, a heart. She, when she walked out of the train, she put a little bag of rolls next to me. That was my one, number one hero. And I have another one even bigger than that. My grandmother had a maid who was also her friend for more than 20 years. Therese. Teresa. She came in the middle of the night to save two photo albums and our set of prayer books, which was very important to us, and a few knickknacks. And when we came back, we said, we want to go to Teresa. They said, she is no longer alive. When the Americans came through that area, they knocked on the door. They thought everybody had ammunition. They would shoot out. And they shot through the door, killing her instantly. She would even come in the middle of the night sometimes 
she had a key to the Jewish cemetery. It was locked. And she would put some food behind my grandfather's tombstone. So that you could go pick it up pick later. It up, yes. And I will say in the village of Jebenhausen, a village of a thousand people. At one time, it was 40% Jewish. There was a baron who permitted them to settle there over 200 years ago. They had to pay higher taxes, and they had to live in one street, separate from the Christian. But of course, later on, they went together, and they went to America. But my family, the Lauchheimer family, were the only family still left in that community. And I will say that the Christians treated us for the most part, uh, righteously. I had only Christian friends. Some of them I still have today. Uh, Elizabeth, who was my very first girlfriend ever, is still my girlfriend today. Her mother was my mother's girlfriend. And she, she was lived, Christian. Yes, absolutely. Tell us a, a little bit about uh, life in Terrazin, where you and both of your parents were for three years. Yes. Yes, they were actually um, the first transports from uh, uh, Württemberg uh, were in 41 to a place called Riga in Latvia, and we were in the transport. Um, and my father wrote a letter to the uh, Gestapo, the secret police, had pictures taken of his wounds, and somehow we got out, but not my beloved grandmother. Now, in the home state where I was born, the Jews were taken out in 1940 already to a place in the Pyrenees up in France, the border of Spain and France um, called the Basque region. So all the Jews in Baden, the state of Baden, were taken out. So it was clear of Jews. Juden Rhein already in 1940 in October they were taken there. So had we been there at that time we would have been transported. It's miraculous that, that you and both of your parents survived. When, when you write in, in three of your books that talk about this experience, uh, 15,000 children, mm -hmm. uh, Jewish children were imprisoned uh, in terrorism and concentration camp and of that perhaps about a hundred survived. Yeah, a little bit more, but if I can backtrack a little bit, if I may, how such a transport was put together. Our transport was very close to 1,200 people, and I was the youngest. I was seven years old. And all the little towns would gather the people to make up this uh, whole transport, which was at least a thousand, ours was very close to 1200, and uh, which uh, took place in Stuttgart, the capital of Württemberg. But before that, they got the people into uh, the places to, to take them from there, and ours, it was in Göppingen, a bigger city, and we had to assemble in the school gymnasium, open everything. We were, of course, we got a directive which stated so many things you can't get out of the transport, no matter how sick you are, no knives, no sharp implements, no forks, nothing. And um, a bedroll, uh, metal dishes. And I remember one of the guards, we had to open everything on the table. He saw I had a little Dutch boy pen. And he ripped it off me. He yelled in the Swabian dialect, du brauchst das nicht, wo du hingehst, meaning you won't need this where you're going to. I'm a little girl, seven years old, and I had my doll in my arm. I was not going to part with my doll and because that was a memory of my grandmother. Who knew where she was? And he ripped her from me too. He looked inside her hollow body to see if I was carrying anything. And I was, and I kind of fought for my doll back and he gave her back to me. And uh, that's uh, how I arrived in Terrazin. Uh, we were on the train for at least two days. It was still a passenger train, very crowded. You couldn't get out. And we arrived in a little town called Bauschewitz and told to drop everything except your bedroll, a little knapsack, metal dishes, and I'm carrying my doll for dear life and marched into the camp. We had many uh, old people on the... And very uh, few children. Uh, I don't remember seeing any. I, I, Maybe there was another one. I don't remember, but I definitely was the youngest in that transport, seven years old. 
And we arrive in Terezin or Theresienstadt, which was actually a fortress town built around 1780 by Emperor Joseph II in memory of his mother Maria Theresia. It was like an army garrison built with red brick barracks. Uh, red uh, brick walls, barbed wire, and wooden fences. And it was a place where the intelligentsia of Europe was sent, the highly decorated war veterans, the um, famous doctors, lawyers, artists. They put them in one place, perhaps to show the world they're all in one place and nothing's going to happen, but every single person there had a death sentence on their head, every single person. You write about the International Red Cross coming yes. and, and the farce that was created Absolutely. To, to let them, uh, to allow them to leave thinking that things were, were uh, entirely different than, right. than reality. Terrorism was like a place, you put cattle, you keep them a while and then you slaughter them. Uh, the next step, would be stopped. It was the antechamber for, for was Auschwitz. It was Auschwitz. And almost everybody was sent out after the International Red Cross inspection, which uh, made a, a theatrical production of the whole place. Uh, they uh, printed money, uh, which w you couldn't buy anything with it, to science, uh, to school, to playground. None of these things really existed. existed. Even a, a play was done, and, uh, and they didn't show them the crematory. Now, we didn't have gas chambers there at that time. They were being built. built. They were not completed yet. Eichmann, who was in charge of the Jewish question, was there many times. I saw him. Whenever he came, another transport out. And especially after the International Red Cross inspection, almost the whole camp was sent to Auschwitz. Out of the 140,000 people between 1941 and 45, two-thirds would be shipped to the killing centers like Auschwitz. Close to a third uh, died there, over 30, th about 34,000 died there of malnutrition, disease. I mean, mice, rats, uh, bed bugs, and fleas. Uh, those were our constant companions. Of course, and hunger, in fact, too. You contracted tuberculosis yes. in the concentration camps. And you suffered from scarlet fever, from measles, yes. from mumps. Yes. How you survived is actually miraculous. And you know that I actually prayed for this disease. For that, TB. Yes, because but, there was a girl in our compound. Most men, women, and children had to live separate, but they could still see each other. Uh, the disabled war veterans lived in a separate area, very crowded, just like everybody else. But two we to were, a bed, uh, two, if well, you had a bed at all. Well, bunk beds, you know, many people in the room. And for two out of the three years, we shared a uh, tiny room without a window with a family from Berlin. They had a daughter named Ruth. Father was also a war veteran and disabled. He had a limp. And she was Christian. And well, the father was half Jewish, the mother totally. In the eyes of the Nazis, she was Jewish, but she was brought up as a devout Christian. And she was sent to Auschwitz. That was devastating for me. And she died in Auschwitz as a devout Christian because of her Jewish heritage. And around us, we had children, the, the children of these uh, parents like mine. Uh, we would see one man had his uh, leg missing or two missing or arm missing, uh, a bullet wound in the head still draining. And one girl, we were told, don't go near her. Uh, she has a terrible disease, but she was getting a little bit more food, maybe an extra piece of bread. Uh, and. Of course we played with her. And I prayed to God at that time. I am so hungry. I need to get a little more food. Please, God, let me have what this girl had. Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. Which plagued you. Yes, for many throughout. years. Many years. In fact, when you finally were liberated, uh, one year later, you and your family made it to the United States. In fact, you talk about uh, that spring of 1945 yes. uh, being reborn. Yes, it is May 8th, um, 1945. May 8th is celebrated every year. Wherever I go, all the teachers know already we celebrate a birthday. 
of my liberation. I lost eight years of schooling. I never finished because my first grade. Because of tuberculosis? Grade. No, not only that. When I started the first grade, um, I had to go to a Jewish school and travel very far with a train. I did that by myself as a six-year-old. And this is in Germany after in liberation. In Germany, yes. Oh, before, before I was sent away, and then it stopped. School stopped after six months, but I could read, write, and do a little math already. But um, when um, we uh, came uh, to uh, America, I, I was in the hospital. There was very little schooling in bed. I was in bed for two years, uh, hardly ever getting off the bed total re bed rest, there was no other cure, and that didn't cure me. And finally, my parents took me home. They mm -hmm. said, it's enough already. And uh, I was even sicker right afterwards, and then this new drug uh, came to be streptomycin. streptomycin, which saved my life at that time. But it wasn't the entire answer either. Um, but at 15, I started my real school career. I went to college after that, and I got sick again. And by that time, I had to leave again another year. I finished high school in three instead of four years. I didn't want to be the oldest one. And um, so uh, then new drugs came out. Uh, I had to take 26 pills a day plus two shots of streptomycin. And of course, I got cured, thank God. You've been back to Terrazin. What, yes. what was it like uh, to see that place Again, the first time I went back was 1966. I wanted to retrace my life. You were 31. Yeah, and um, I didn't tell my parents that I was going to go there, and it looked almost the same as I left it. I found the house. People were living there again. It looked terrible. I've been back many times since then. Today it is being rebuilt. The whole town is being rebuilt. But it is a very sad town. And I remember it was raining the first day I went back, first time. And there were children running around. And I, I was devastated. I said, where are the children who were here? Ian, I think it was in 2000, uh, e uh, Elie uh, Wiesel. Elie Wiesel. Uh, spoke before the German parliament. It was at the beginning of the Holocaust Remembrance Day, and he said, I come before you yes. without bitterness or hatred, mm -hmm. uh, which to me was absolutely amazing. But then he said, he asked them, why have the German people not asked the Jewish population for forgiveness? And sometime later that actually came. He said this would change the world. I I'd like to talk about forgiveness. Right. Well, um, it, it, that's a very difficult uh, problem. They have asked me uh, I have, for forgiveness. They have. I have many friends today in Germany, and I go every year, sometimes twice, to speak to the point of exhaustion from Berlin all the way down to Trier, the oldest city in Germany, which is the furthest south. Clergy have said, uh, you come back, you forgive us. I said, no. I believe that the people who actually did the killing, like the one who killed my grandmother. Shot at, dead in a forest. Yeah, well, I went to see those places. It was just horrible. I went to see it a few years ago, these mass graves. And for all intents and purposes, I should be in one of them. In Riga, the, the Birkenike Forest has, I think, 52 mass graves. Between 50 and 80,000 people are in there. It's a memorial now, and I, all my friends are there, my, my grandmother, etc. And um, I don't think everybody was uh, involved in this, but most were. Uh, I believe in reconciliation. Uh, especially with the young people, and I speak to thousands over there. My German is still good. And uh, forgiveness of this, no, of, of the actual people who did it, no. That is in the Jewish faith. If it is premeditated murder, then only the person who was killed can forgive. Of course, it's a personal thing. But I don't have to be a hater. I have reconciled my life for this, um, especially with the younger people. 
How concerned are you with the dwindling numbers of Holocaust survivors that we could forget? Well, it's, you know, it, 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 people can read it in books. Uh, there are many films, but of course you have the Holocaust deniers today. Who can say, well, the books, they're telling stories, it may not be true. The movies, it's Hollywood. And as long as the survivors are still alive, you can touch them, you can ask them questions, and it makes it much more real. Yes, the time will come that there will be none left. And uh, Spielberg did a very uh, marvelous job in the interviews that he uh, permitted to be done, uh, many, many thousands. I did one too. And uh, perhaps that will help, you know, you, because you hear it from the actual person. First hand. First hand. Inga Auerbacher, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Inga Auerbacher. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find excerpts from Auerbacher's books. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.